So with that, I welcome you to, um, let me find the uh, <laughs> Uh, rooted, rooted in relationship, building a, I think it's building an integrated model for the treatment of eating disorders. Um, so the two folks that I want to introduce you to today are uh, Gail Brooks and Melanie uh, Smith. And uh, you can see them up there, Gail and Melanie. Gail on the right, I don't know where they are in yours. Um, I will read this uh, lengthy uh, and uh, impressive um, bio. So Gail Brooks, Dr. Gail Brooks, is a vice president and chief clinical officer for the Renfrew Center. Dr. Brooks leads the Renfrew's Clinical Excellent, Excellence Board and the Clinical Training Department. Uh, and this is no small thing, given that they have 19 sites that they have <laughs> training at. Uh, she has clinical oversight responsibility for Renfrew's residential facility in Florida and for the non-residential sites in Tennessee, California, North Carolina, Illinois, Florida, and Georgia. Up until this past year, she traveled all the time, right, Gail? It's not right. Gail. <laughs> For the past 30 years, she has treated patients from diverse backgrounds who suffer from eating disorders. Dr. Brooks served as the eating disorders specialist in the HBO film, Thin. She's appeared on Good Morning America and has been featured in the following publications, the New York Times, People Magazine, Essence Magazine, and Perspectives, the Renfrew Center Foundation's Journal for Professionals. She's a frequent presenter at conferences and workshops. Dr. Brooks speaks on topics such as the treatment of complex uh, patient eating disorders and uh, complex trauma, I'm assuming, patient eating disorders and cultural diversity, and the interplay between eating disorders and trauma and eating disorders in mid midlife women. Dr. B uh, Dr. Brooks is a certified eating disorders specialist and approved supervisor, um, a former IAEDP, which is one of the national uh, eating disorder uh, regulatory boards or conferences, as we'll say, and is the current chair of the IAEDP Senior Advisory Council and former co-chair of the AED Diversity, um, what's the SIG? SIG. Special interest group. Thank you. <laughs> that, in a nutshell, is Gail. Um, welcome, Gail. Uh, so Thank excited you. that you're here. Mm -hmm. Melanie Smith, uh, who is on the right, is a director of training uh, for the Renfrew Center. As a director of the clinical training department, she is responsible responsible for developing and implementing implementing. I'm so sorry, guys. I'm tripping up over my words clinical training and programming that is consistent with the emerging research and evidence-based practice. In this role, she provides ongoing supervision and consultation to clinicians across mental health disciplines for the purpose of continually assessing and improving fidelity and competence of treatment delivery of the Renfrew's new unified treatment model, which they're gonna both be describing today. Dr. Smith is a certified eating disorder specialist and approved supervisor and has extensive training in the unified protocol for the transdiagnostic treatment of emotional disorders, the UP, um, Barlow's work out of BU, and is a UP certified therapist and trainer. Melanie, welcome. Um, I want to say just a little bit in terms of bringing these folks here. Um, and mostly they're gonna present this, but um, as we were planning colloquia and thinking about, you know, kind of interesting uh, topics and folks to bring in to kind of showcase what they've done and the work that's being done out there for, for with RCT, I just felt like, you know, these guys have done this just phenomenal Herculean, I don't know how many more kind of like uh, Roman, god or goddess uh, illusions I can develop, but this huge, this huge undertaking to combine these models and really do something, I, I think, uh, very, very different in the world of eating disorders. So um, I, I'm thrilled that you're here and sharing with our group, um, you know, and it, it goes without saying there's such overlap of our group. So welcome. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Um, you know, Amy, when you reached out to uh, Mel and I to present with you, I, we were just so honored and um, just it's a treat, actually. Um, we feel like you've been so integral in our evolutionary journey as a treatment facility in terms of our treatment model um, and that you've given some support and guidance and 
I think what we've valued more than anything is the fact that you can be quite frank in your feedback. <laughs> so it has been, um, that has really sort of helped us as we've grown. And so today what we really want to um, kind of share with you is, is a bit of our story um, in terms of how we have evolved. And um, also uh, some critical lessons that we've learned about the importance of really staying rooted in relationship. Um, that this has been something that we've kind of gone through um, to, um, a lot of renditions of in terms of understanding. So Mel's going to be uh, moving the slides for me. So Mel, you want to go to the next slide here? I want to start with just sharing with you some info, um, just some background about the Renfrew Center. Um, we were founded in 1985 as the first really comprehensive residential treatment facility uh, treating women with eating disorders. Um, since that time, we've become one of the largest eating disorder networks across the country. We have uh, two residential sites and we have 17 what we call non-residential. They are like uh, PHP programs, partial hospitalization and intensive outpatient programs. And we're in over 15 states. So we, we've got a pretty wide sort of therapeutic footprint. Um, and we treat thousands of um, individuals with eating disorders every year. Uh, when we first opened our doors in 1985, we were really, because we were the first, there really wasn't much uh, to go on in terms of what was the most effective treatment for uh, individuals with eating disorders. There really wasn't a, a research field going on at that time. And um, so we, we looked outside of the field of eating disorders to um, get a sense of what, what could help us to most effectively treat the women that we were seeing. Because at that time, it was really what we saw were women and it was really felt that eating disorders were disorders of women. Um, Fortunately, at that time, some very exciting stuff was happening at the Stone Center. And that really took our attention and, and we felt like this was something that could really help us, guide us um, in terms of the work that we were doing. We felt that it was a really good fit, the principles, the values in terms of, of you know, what we could see women with eating disorders kind of struggling with this sort of profound sense of disempowerment and, you know, um, very traumatic relationships in their lives and whatnot. Um, so we uh, adopted um, RCT at the time to uh, really be at the core of our treatment. Um, it has guided in many ways, um, both our environmental, um, our, our our physical environment and you know, how we sort of designed the program, very group-based, um, which at that time was pretty revolutionary. We, we weren't really treating people in groups. It was much more individual, but doing a lot of group work, having a setting that is more sort of retreat-like rather than hospital-like. And it was very much defining how as a staff we related to one another as well as how we related to patients. So we felt like it just was a very, um, cutting edge and also very um, appropriate uh, treatment model for us. Okay, Mel, you wanna switch to the next slide? So one of the things that we realized um, back, you know, since 1985 is that um, the field of eating disorders, you know, evolved, that there actually began to be a lot more sort of research happening in the field um, and began to, Sort of find that there were there's a growing body of research that was indicating that certain types of interventions seem to be more effective in producing symptom reduction and behavior change and that these were being sort of labeled as evidence-based treatments and i'm sure you guys are sort of all aware of some of that sort of movement that has had has been going on both in the medical field and also in the mental health field and there was a lot of um sort of growing focus for us around the need um, to be uh, indicating that we were incorporating evidence-based interventions into evidence-based with quotes as we were put there because a lot of the evidence was really based on cognitive behavioral therapies that were being um, researched a lot more at that time. But that there were um, expectations from our credentialing boards, from insurance companies, and even from professional ethics boards that you were um, including um, uh, more cognitive behavioral types of interventions into our treatment. 
Um, there was also much more emphasis on us being able to show that we were producing measurable change. You know, I think up until the time when people would ask, you know, is your treatment effective? I say, of course it is. You know, yes, we see patients coming and blossoming and, and you know, just really um, uh, recovering in some very significant ways. But if you couldn't sort of reduce it down to numbers and say, you know, that we, yes, we did the study and it shows that whatever, that um, it was hard to, you know, sometimes you would really get pushback um, on that. The other thing that I think was causing sort of tension within our organization to start to look at, you know, um, do we need to evolve our model is the fact that we were growing. You know, we'd started out as, you know, two, one, and then two, and then grew to 19 different sites and you know, hundreds of therapists and whatnot. And we needed to begin to look at how do we standardize this? How do we know that what we're doing is what we expect our staff to be doing and that we are getting the outcomes that we need? So we knew that we needed to start to step back and to really look at our treatment model and to begin to um, assess what changes we may want to, to kind of uh, bring about. It was really at that time that we developed um, a clinical excellence board. And we also brought on outside advisors to help us to uh, really digest and understand the research that was out there and to look at what would be a good fit for us if we were going to evolve our model with um, a component like this. Um, and we have we had Amy join our, our um, advisory board for a very specific reason. And I don't know Amy, if you always knew this, but we sort of saw you as the roots that you were gonna keep us rooted in what was at our core, which was being really, you know, having a relational model. Um, and fortunately you have to stay true to that for us. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we weren't gonna be spinning off in some direction that just was not gonna be true to, to who we are. Um, so that, um, all of those things were sort of put into place um, at that time. Mel, you want to go to the next slide? So as you can imagine, um, when we started to first think about at, um, incorporating a, a manualized evidence-based treatment, cognitive uh, behavioral treatment, there was a lot of concern. I mean, I just think in general, there's a lot of concern about these types of, of um, treatments. Um, you know, they're considered gold standard, but that, that's because they're the ones that have been mainly studied. You know, when you, you don't know what something can do unless you really study it. And so because they had been studied a lot, there was sort of the expectation that it was, it really should be kind of ruling the day. Um, so um, we understood that, that, you know, these types of, of therapeutic approaches can be um, rather cookie cutter, meaning that, you know, you treat everybody the same, you use a manual, you know, you just basically, um, you know, forge ahead with, with interventions in a, in a pretty systematic way. It can, that, that it tends to be more robotic, you know, that there's not the sort of relational qualities that we know are important um, in terms of uh, um, therapy and patient outcomes. And, um, you know, and just the fact that it can be kind of cold. You know, our staff had that concern. We surveyed them before we even did this. And that's the kind of stuff they were telling us is that, oh my goodness, this is not gonna be good. Um, and so we um, decided, and I, I think I really sort of put myself out there as thinking, you know what, don't worry. Really just don't worry. We're gonna be able to do this. Now you wanna go to the next slide? Because we are um, relational, we don't need to worry about all that stuff, that we're gonna, we can do this kind of evidence-based uh, cognitive behavioral treatment, and we will naturally be relational because that's who we are. And so we're gonna really do this well. Um, so um, we uh, spent a lot of time, we thought that what was gonna be the most challenging part of all of this was really teaching our staff how to do the cognitive behavioral treatment. And so we spent a lot of time um, developing tr uh, training materials, um, patient handbooks and therapist manuals and you know, setting up training uh, sessions and whatnot to really be able to uh, make sure that our staff was well-trained in how to do all of this. Um, and so I, once we had done a lot of that, I brought our advisors back together to really sort of present to them what we had been working on and the fact that we had found a model, which is the unified protocol that we felt was best fit for us because it was emotion focused. It was manualized, but it was emotion focused and that it would really work well. And so I sort of presented this 
dog and pony show of what we're doing to really get our staff on board with it. And this was one of the times when, they, when Amy's feedback, again, kind of emblazoned on my brain. She said to me, she said, Gail, I think you're putting the cart before the horse. And I thought, cart before the horse, what do you mean by that? And what she was trying to say to me at the time was that, you know, you're focusing on this cognitive behavioral thing and you're not centralizing the relational cultural piece of it. And I said to Amy, don't worry, because we are naturally relational. That's our model. It's at our core. That's what we're going to do. It's going to be great. And uh, she didn't quite believe me. And I said, well, listen, here's what I'm going to do. I said, I'm going to have our most relational therapist do one of these manualized groups for you so that you can take a look at it and see, you know, how, how well it kind of integrates together. Um, so what I did at that time was to turn to our most relational therapist, who was Melanie Smith, uh, our director of training. And I'm gonna have you have her talk a little bit about what this experience was like for her. But just to sort of set this up a little bit for you, when I went to Mel, I said, you know, Mel, you know what, we need to um, show Amy how this works. So I'm gonna have, we're gonna videotape you doing a mock group. I'm gonna send it to Amy and she's gonna give us some feedback and she's gonna see how well you're doing. And Mel was like, you're gonna videotape me and you're gonna send it to Amy and she's gonna critique it. And I said, yeah, yeah, we're gonna show her because you're gonna send it to Amy. And she was like really having an issue with it, but she did it. Mel, I'm gonna let you pick it up from there. <laughs> well, and I, I'm wondering how well, I'm assuming we're foreshadowing really well as to what you think the outcome was. It's, uh, I think we're giving you, setting you up nicely to say that perhaps, um, the assumption that we had that we were we were going to show Amy that we already knew what we were doing um, turned out to not quite be the case. So, um, and as Gail was asking me to do this, the context within this right is that I saw myself as you know kind of an Amy Banks fan girl. I had attended many workshops at conferences, sat in the back and like notes, but you know we didn't have a relationship. We had never met before. We had never talked before. But I very much knew who this this person was and was very. Um, I very much admired Amy and her work, um, and therefore I think the element of anxiety that was already there with, you know, just being videotaped doing your work or even pretending to do your work because it wasn't even a real group, <laughs> um, just kind of heightened um, my own anxiety, um, which you can imagine played out on the videotape. So when we did this video, we decided we wanted to give ourselves an extra challenge as if it wasn't challenging enough and use our most densely psychoeducational group that even existed. I mean, it couldn't have been more vanilla and white bread CBT. And um, I, for an hour, did a pretend group trying to do what my um, very uh, nebulous and um, rudimentary understanding of what being relational was. Um, I, I definitely had not absorbed yet um, the principles um, in a way that was meaningful. Um, and I thought that being kind and nice um, was, that was kind of the, the moral of the story of what I thought was sufficient. Um, and uh, so, so what ended up happening was that uh, not only was Amy going to review the videotape and give us feedback, but um, we were going to fly to Boston in January, and I live in Florida, so let's go to Boston in January, where I don't even have the right clothes for this, and we're going to hang out with Amy for two very intense days, and we're going to watch the video together, oh, with other people, and she's going to give you feedback. So um, I, I didn't end up with an ulcer at the end, but the amount of, um, again, internal angst, because I, I wanted to do a good job. Uh, I, I wanted Amy to think that I did a good job. And um, that's not entirely what happened. So, um, and it, when Amy and Gail pre-talked about it after she watched the tape, but before we flew to Boston, um, Gail said, so how was it? I don't know what the full context of the conversation was, but I only know the part that Gail shared with me was <laughs> that um, I, a comment that Amy said, which again, we will all, look, she later face, she's like, ooh. Uh, that was the least relational thing I've ever seen. Now she started out with Melanie's a lovely person. Gail <laughs> didn't share that part. She's she's she was like she's yeah, context. 
yeah. again, the, and the reason I'm sharing the story, one, it's, it's mildly, it's humorous, especially when it wasn't you and I, I, what ended up happening in those two days in Boston, when we actually were face to face together and connecting in that room were probably the most powerful of all of my career in really um, growing me as a clinician and, and a human being. Um, and was really transformational, not only to my own, um, who I am as a therapist, but ultimately to what the model evolved to become because it had, it, it, it had not gotten there yet. Um, so Amy, <laughs> I don't know if you want to share your, your perspective um, on that. Yeah, I mean, what, you know, I, I would, what I would like to say is, um, you know, in, in some ways, I, I think you did a phenomenal job in that relational job in that you put yourself out there, you took risks, you made yourself vulnerable, all of those are, you know, kind of characteristics that I think are, are so embedded in the, the, the way that we work as, you know, RCT clinicians. So, you know, I was looking at the, the, the actual interactions and the power dynamics and a whole lot of things that weren't there, but I, you know, in fairness to you, I have to say you, you know, I think you are, you know, you were um, an exceedingly good sport and really, and it really open, but, but I think, um, you know, one of the things that I think for, for anybody listening and thinking, God, how would I ever integrate, you know, the, this model I use with RCT or how to do this? I mean, I think one of the, you know, the things that's most important is that realization that, you know, that kind of idea of simply being nice or being respectful or be, you know, any number of those things are, you know, are part and parcel of RCT, but they're not the nuts and bolts in that, in the, the micro interactions that we, that we see and we have on a moment to moment basis. And, you know, once you do the deep dive into that, you're really talking about a very, very different, and I think kind of sophisticated, a complex model, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I feel like we did the deep dive into, which was incredibly rewarding I, for me as well. I mean, just thrilling. right. And, and had that experience, that first experience not happened, I don't know if we would have gotten there. Right. No. Right. right. Like, so it, so it really was um, critical in, in our own um, ability to even see what we couldn't, that we were blind to see. Right, before. that's right. You didn't know, um, what, you don't know what you don't know. And, mm -hmm. and you're right. I, I mean, particularly after this, you know, as you said, the 35 year, 35 year plus history of being identified, you know, yes. having, having RCT practitioners be, I think, Jean presented, I think all yeah. of us, Jean and Irene and Judy and Maureen and me and, you know, kind of layers and layers of RCT folks and Karen Samuels and Mary Tentillo, yeah. I mean, all of these RCT practitioners, but you know, <laughs> but, but that in and of itself did not Wasn't enough. Yeah. 19 mm -hmm. sites kind of rise to the occasion and, and do the deep dive. So that's what mm -hmm. I'd say. So go ahead. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and that part of, you know, um, where we were at was that originally, again, with our kind of conceptualization of what we were trying to do were um, take these two seemingly disparate um, ways of, of thinking about the way that people experience the world around them and the best way to then thus deal with that were these two kind of separate pillars, this kind of evidence-based CBT rigid pillar. And then there's the relational cultural pillar. And we were just trying to like take some silly putty and like smush them together and be like, ta-da. And then when we realized that that was a little clumsy, we're like, well, we can have a more sophisticated way to talk about this. And that really, you know, let's think about um, the, the cognitive behavioral strategies as, as the what of what we're doing and the RCT is the how, again, which you could kind of see if I was thinking like that, how and why on that videotape, I thought that being um, calm and respectful and warm was going to be sufficient to be relational, quote unquote. And that um, that experience really allowed us to see how far apart we still were and how disconnected um, our, our way of thinking about this model was. Um, and then Amy really brought us into this place of this kind of metaphor of the double helix. Um, 
Would you be able to explain that a little bit more, Amy, as far as how oh, what, <laughs> the double helix? Forgive me for for <laughs> bringing up the double helix, but if you imagine it, the sort of you can see there on the the, the screen, okay, the difference between having two. It's almost like parallel play that that version of development where it's parallel play the two you know you could have the uniform protocol cbt stuff in parallel play with rct but you know as you said there's a loose kind of um grouping you know kind of tied together loosely as opposed to really integrating the model so i think what the the helix represents is yeah there's these two strands but there are not just one little band joining them, there is a, an entire integration process, right? So that, mm -hmm. you know, um, one of the things, Gail, I know you say is, is that uh, RCT became the what as well. They're both the what, right? And in a culture that overvalues the what, when you start saying that relationship is the how, it devalues it, right? And mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, I think the original, the original thing we had to do is get these two, you know, kind of do the, um, the, tr the translation or the deconstruction of the culture that, that all of this is in to really see that evidence-based is rarefied because of our culture, right? Not necessarily, you know, and, you know, I think this is a group that sort of appreciates that and that there are, you know, there's plenty of what in depth and uh you know it was a chunkiness to rct as well except that we don't see it that way right uh -huh. so the relationship you know it's like like women holding the relational world while the men do the work right mm -hmm. of of you know kind of that old model and it felt like that as i was sitting there listening and you know in these meetings and it, it quite frankly early on i was sort of panicked like this is really slipping you know um but to see you guys begin to really take that in right and transform this whole model to seeing that they're both the what's and that the you know the relationship in and of itself the physiology of that is such a concrete what right mm -hmm. and that the you know kind of the you know what uh, i call the four pathways of connection you know you're talking over here about uniform protocol and emotions and emotional regulation and here you have an interpersonal way of regulating those emotions that was being disappeared, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, so yeah. that's a little I'd say about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so as we tried to kind of really evolve and and really integrate and embody the double helix, there were quite a few kind of tangible steps towards this integration, um, which Amy was the the foundation and the center and who we went to for all of this. Um, and first of it really just started with our own training. So again, that, that fateful Boston uh, January uh, trip was certainly the, a, a big foundational piece for us and for me in particular. Um, Amy, is there? Yeah, you want me to say, I know that we're talking about this. Yeah. yeah, the training. So, you know, into, so as we, as we kind of, you know, stewed or gotten more and more and more immersed, um, what I would say is, is, what became clear is the enormity of the task, partly, mm -hmm. right? In that, you know, you're talking about, um, you know, 19, 19 sites, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, hundreds of therapists, thousands of patients, administrators, and how do you, you know, have this integrated model and then disseminate it? And I'm going to let you guys talk about it, but, you know, if you just look here, we, we thought about these steps, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody, everybody needs this RCT training in conceptualization, right? That, 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 you know, kind of being on the laurels of resting on your laurels wasn't going to be enough. You really needed to be and get this specific training as did everybody that you onboarded into the organization, right? Mm -hmm. Huge, 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 right? So once you get the, you know, the training manual. Um, and so one of the things, even thinking about the groups, as I shared with you that, that uh, Kate Dooley, I think, and Judy Jordan, Judy's not on the call today, I think Kate Dooley is, but that, that they had made a relational practice. So there were um, a, relational, a group relational practice manual and that you could use this, right? To actually help people develop these skills, to highlight them to, you know, it's an eight, 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 eight uh, group manual. Um, and then really conceptualizing that milieu, I mean, you know, this milieu training, the basis of milieu training, what is the milieu? It's relationships, right? Mm -hmm. And so how, 
so you've got you know the milieu is the holding relationship and that's a that's a whole you know interwoven network right but again the depth at which you all took this on and i i wonder if you can comment on you know kind of because the way i see it is you did both the depth but also the breadth of getting, you know, implementing this. And that's the thing that I've always been so impressed by. Well, yes, because there's been, well, you helped us find the depth. Cause I just remember sitting there and being like, but how do I teach people how to do this? And how do I teach this many people how to do this? How do I make it tangible? Especially when we've got multidisciplinary folks, folks of different um, uh, experience levels. Um, and that once you really helped break it down for us and we're very, um, generous in sharing of your training materials that you had developed over the years that that really made it a lot more tangible for us as a clinical trainers to be able to really utilize. Um, so one thing that that certainly shifted significantly is that our our training was no longer just we're going to do all this CBT training psychoeducation psycho and then you know every once in a while we'll mention some relational stuff we we really needed to prioritize relational training in an ongoing, way. And I'm talking about from theory and principles all the way down, you know, starting there first, making sure that everyone is on the same page and really understanding it with a lot more depth than I started with for sure. Um, and then understanding what is the application? How does this actually look and feel in your interactions with, with each other as, as clinicians and, and with the clients that we serve? Um, and that um, there's been so much kind of ongoing attention to, to all of the training and that we, we want to make sure that it doesn't kind of drift away. Um, it's very easy to go to a training just like I did. I'd gone to many of Amy's workshops before and been very jazzed and excited and felt the zest and took a lot of notes. And then, you know, time goes by and you kind of revert back to what is, what is your default or comfortable and you start to kind of muddy the waters and forget things a little bit. So really knowing that we had to be intentional about the repetition in the learning, because this really was like learning and creating some new neural pathways um, and, and just making sure that we don't fall back into what had happened in the past where we really started to lose our roots and not, not quite remember where we came from. Um, so in an ongoing way, you know, we as a training department kind of have eyes on, we, we participate in groups, we observe groups, we audio record, there's so many recordings. Um, and our, our goal was to really try to do our best to give the type of feedback that Amy provided to us that was so valuable to our, our growth mm -hmm. as clinicians and find a way to, um, to do this so that we know that any client that walks into a Renfrew Center location anywhere in the 19 locations will be getting the same quality um, of, of, of care and that um, when we say on our website that we um, are founded in relational principles that we can actually back that up. Right. It's, a, it's not just a, a brand strategy right. anymore. Um, so if you kind of think about what this model has, has become, it's really, again, this, this integration of these things. So yes, there is the cognitive behavioral skill building that is there and that serves a pretty explicit behavior change function um, and serve some of those those tension for change needs of being able to measure certain particular metrics that are important to insurance companies and accrediting agencies and things like that. But really the relational skill development of again the clinician and the clients of course, right that we're we're building their capacity to move and be moved by another person. That's where it all really starts. And that all of this has to happen within the context of, of their cultural, experience of who they're they're intersecting identities and that this is kind of what we're trying to to bring forward and that these two things don't have to live in in different worlds and that it's better for it um so it turned into a thing <laughs> it turned into a thing the uh the, the a big thing um so oxford university press that kind of does all of these and you know again in air quotes evidence-based uh treatment manuals meaning they've given it the whatever that means um seal of approval um and what we what we think or what best that we can tell is that this um manual um is more representative than than any of the others that kind of exist in that there was very intentional inclusion 
of um, cultural context, of diversity related issues, of very explicit attention to the impact of oppression and marginalization. You're not going to find that, I don't think, in a typical CBT <laughs> treatment manual. Um, and that great care was attended to, to really do that and to infuse the relational cultural principles into the language throughout uh, this, which is not a typically Oxford thing, I don't think. <laughs> you would see. And then along the way, there's also been, you know, ongoing adaptations in this process to try to continue to really um, engage and keep, remain connected to um, the folks that we're working with, which has also taken on a whole nother level of complexity um, over the past year when, you know, 17 of our 19 locations went completely virtual. Um, and that, that has, again, continued to kind of stretch us, but has also, you know, we were at a significant advantage because we had had such a, a solid infrastructure over the past few years of, of training and, you know, getting our staff all um, speaking the same language that was um, infinitely helpful when, you know, the world changed overnight and allowed us to be able to continue to do what we do um, and just figure out the technology. That was really the thing that we had to worry about because we, what we didn't have to worry about as we all kind of scattered was that we were all still gonna be speaking the same language. Yeah. Yeah. So let me, let me say a, a, a few other things and then um, I really wanna, do wanna open it up um, for questions and uh, just a reminder that people can ask questions in the share. Um, um, I wonder, do you want to, yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, so again, you know, I just, you know, I, 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 I want to again, emphasize the size and scale with which you guys have done this, um, you know, over 19 sites over, you know, in, you know, both the depth and the breadth, which I have found um, unusual and I've not seen anywhere, quite frankly, in all, all of my psychiatry travails. Um, I just haven't seen it before. Um, and, you know, one of the questions I have for you all, and, and I don't actually obviously know the, the ins and outs of this, but, you know, one of the things that I think most people would say, but the Renfrew is a private psychiatric hospital, like, um, one of the things that has allowed this to happen is that there has been the backing of the president and CEO of the organization. You know, there was buy-in. This has been, I'm assuming, just enormously expensive in, in both, you know, man, women power, um, travel, you know, and whatnot. Um, and I'd love, I'd love to hear thoughts about that, you know, um, you know, just, how did how did you do this? How did all of you do this? Well, I you know, I, I think you're so right that it has been a big endeavor um, on our part and a big commitment. And the fact that we are um, not only privately owned but a, a family business um, has its advantage because I just have to convince the family that this is the right way to go, you know, and so that if if the folks that have as much passion and commitment to the organization um, doing well are at the top of the organization and they want to have really um, cutting edge, high quality care going on, it, it was possible to get the buy-in and the trust at that, at that point. And I, I know how rare that is and, and, and also sort of how important it was. And it was scary for them. I mean, it was really going out on a limb because we were branded as relational. And I'm saying, we're gonna go like down this road and do you know, cognitive behavioral and, you know, and uh, we're gonna need all of these resources. We need a full training department. We need a full research department to do. And, and so it was really going out on a limb. But I, I have to say, I, I think that's where Renfrew started. You know, that's why we were the first to do what we did in 1985 was that, there was a um, willingness to step out and, and do something, you know, that was uh, meaningfully sort of cutting edge. I don't know if Judy, if you've got thoughts about that. I know Judy is um, with Renfrew as well and has been from the very early eight, uh, days. Yeah, it's bringing me back to lots of memories. I've been at Renfrew since uh, it opened in 1985 before we even had patients there. And um, I think the same creativity and risk-taking and 
forward thinking um, that generated the beginning in 1985 has really continued through time where, where Gail and Melanie started to focus in and really create a whole training program after it was kind of sold <laughs> to uh, Sam Menegut, who is the uh, CEO and the owner. Um, that was really a huge commitment financially and time-wise on the whole organization's side. Uh, but to give the support to Melanie and Gail and create the training department that went all over. I mean, I do think that it was very cutting edge at the beginning in 85. And I think that this is very cutting edge. And knowing mm -hmm. that there are so many uh, competitors out there now, when we started, Renfrew was the first and only, and now there are so many treatment facilities out there, many of which have been uh, sort of consolidated and bought by private equity. And so they're not independently owned and they have a very, very different structure. Um, but these other programs are not doing this. I mean, I have been a witness to all of this and I have to say I, am, I have been and I remain awestruck at how it got started and how it has moved forward and trained so many. We have so many staff people. When we started at Renfrew, there were 30 of us. That's the administrative people, the therapists, and so forth. There are over 600 people that work for the organization. Many of them, many of them are clinical people. And these are the people that have been trained. So it was a wonderful process. And, you know, it did get a lot of support. And we've had research behind it. And, I mean, I, I, I remain very um, sort of humbled by, by what the training department has done. And um, I see it evolving. And so Renfrew is an evolving organization. You know, we started one way, we've integrated this and who knows what the future is going to be. But it's, uh, it's really been a great journey for me. And I think, you know, what we're putting out there in the world is very, very special. Yeah. So there's a, a question. Um, uh, uh, Heidi wants to know where, where you can get the Jordan and Dooley manual. It's not, it's out of print. Um, one thought is we may have it, I have to look, we might have it in the bibliography of our website. Um, so you can check ICGC. Um, and okay, so Susan says, uh, so to, to, to the two of you, can you give some specific examples of how CBT and RCT manifested in a double helix way? Curious about what that looked like. So maybe take a, you know, an issue that would come up in eating disorder treatment and yeah, yeah. you um I, were, you were you asking for were you say susan and me did you no 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 i'm sorry i'm talking to oh. gail and melanie oh, okay 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 okay, okay. Melanie. all Thanks. right melanie you want i just i just have at some point some moments from the past <laughs> okay uh, okay right mel do you want to talk a little bit about sure. that sure okay so um you know an example that, that I could use is that one of the key like CBT, you know, intervention, right, could be depending on which version of CBT you're using is called an ARC or an ABC, or it's a basically a way of walking a client through an emotional experience where there's an antecedent or a trigger or a situational trigger, an emotional response, and then a consequence or an outcome, right? So this is kind of a standard. And if you, you know, went to graduate school anytime after the 90s, like this is what is beaten into your head is like, this is the way that you do treatment. And this is certainly a part of the, the model that, that we, that the cognitive behavioral pieces that we use. But what we found is that when looking at that intrapsychic experience alone, without the context and without uh, the relational piece, you miss so much. So for example, if I'm working with um, a woman of color that is talking about, um, and we're doing this exercise of this antecedent of, um, you know, having a performance evaluation with her white male boss, and he gave her some difficult feedback that she was having a strong emotional response to. And I did it in kind of your you know, CBT manual way, I would want to understand what emotions she was experiencing, what thoughts, what was coming up in her body, and then what did she do? What was the consequence or outcome? And that it very it would be very easy to go along this conversation and talk about how she was feeling anger and frustration um, and irritability and that, you know, one of the outcomes or consequences might have been that she, you know, got really upset and cried at work or 
um, was really having a hard time trusting her boss. And it would be very easy um, without any context to pathologize this and to try to understand, you know, how do you better control your emotions <laughs> without, without thinking about what are all the historical antecedents? What's all of the experiences that she's had as a woman of color in her life and her educational experiences and experiences in this office, in this relationship with this man? What, what does that do? And how much does it actually make a lot of sense that she's experiencing incredible anger and feeling, you know, unjustly treated and um, really, you know, being attuned to looking for these sorts of things versus what can so easily happen and being like, oh, this emotional response is the problem and we need to figure out why you had this big disproportionate disordered emotion and we need to teach you some coping skills to fix it, um, which is, you know, incredibly, you know, problematic and short-sighted, but that's kind of what you could potentially get if you're not looking looking at these sorts of things and really leaning in and moving towards understanding um, the, the client's experience in this much deeper way. Um, so that's a, about as good of an example. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, if I could um, follow up on that, I, I wonder, so in that case very specifically, I don't know if this is a, you know, something you're, you're remembering, um, you know, but what have you found it, like, what have you found people's response if, you know, how do they respond to you holding the bigger context? I mean, what? what well, it, feeling seen for the first time, right? Because we're trying to validate these experiences that likely, and I am thinking of a specific person, sorry. a specific, sorry, my Apple Watch decided to comment on that. <laughs> um, uh, that have so often been unseen and invalidated. Right, and that if I could just that you know one see and and validate what that had to be like and sit in that space before we go into this like solution oriented problem solving let's solve this problem, which is so easy to do, but just to sit in in the emotion and in the experience, um, yeah. is something that I that certainly we we I wasn't doing prior to this that I wasn't. Um, doing and just the healing power of being seen <laughs> and being you know the pain being acknowledged in and of itself uh, obviously was the most important piece of that stepwise you know kind of puzzle yeah yep um so we've got let's see uh kate dooley kate you said you can talk about a couple of examples from way back in the beginning of mclean mm -hmm. hospital um mm -hmm. with uh, trying to combine RCT and CBT? Oh, you're on uh, mute. Yes, uh, and, and I, I found back then, you know, that, that you, cognitive behavior therapy doesn't work without a relationship. You know, it really, you, you can't be a technician. And, and so it was important to me to bring the relational piece in to the program to the, with, with the eating, eating disorder. And, you know, I was, I was kind of, there wasn't a lot of funding. It was like me developing it. So it did. And I found also that there was a co high correlation between PTSD and, and eating disorder pe people that were hospitalized. It was one-on-one, -on -one, when I, one-to-one, -one if I, when I looked at our population of who came inpatient, that there was always, if not trauma, there was an event, an early event that, that derailed these kids and shut them down from their feelings. And so an important part of the treatment became, um, well, you got to deal with the symptom, you know, to just so they're not going to kill themselves or, <laughs> or whatever, but uh, uh, then to really begin to understand what, what went on, what happened developmentally. And, you know, when did you first feel this way? And, and also because they didn't, they don't, they don't differentiate feelings. You know, I didn't, kids would come in it wasn't about feelings it was about I feel anxious because I ate too much I, you know it was all about food and that so bringing that developmental piece in was really important for them mm -hmm. to understand that something that happened is having an impact now and they don't know how to talk about it because they never had any help differentiating feelings because they had to hide you know mm -hmm. from whatever it was that was being that was too much for them, overwhelming, you know, just emotionally too much. And, and so that, that piece, I think, is the 
important piece because the cognitive behavior, there's two levels of symptoms. One is the behavioral symptoms. One is the cognitive symptoms. And you can't get to the other stuff until you get to the, got to, you got to first make a relationship. Then you got to get to the symptoms. How are we going to work with the symptom and find better strategies for coping? And then the, um, you know, the, uh, how do we talk about feelings, you know, and how, how do we begin to understand what, what is driving this eating disorder? And doing that in the group was the, you know, I mean, people were seen individually, but the group, the power of the group is, I can't, you can't say enough about it. And, um, you know, when I, it, it was difficult because it, at that time it was Catherine Halmy in New York was the only other program I knew about. So she and I would communicate around difficult cases and she would back me up <laughs> because, you know, even the psychiatry at McLean would say, you know, you're being too controlling when you have with, with this coping skill stuff, you know, let her do what she's going to do. Or they didn't, they didn't want to work with the eating disorder and it was food we were talking about, but they were functionally psychotic. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're functionally psychotic. You got to, you got to deal with it at that level. So when I went to Brandeis, I was able to like set up a model, my own model of make the relationship, deal with the symptom, deal with the behavioral and the cognitive symptom, understand where this started and why developmentally, what was going on, and be able to tap into those feelings that are getting unearthed now. Mm -hmm. and, and, and little by little, you know, be able to name the feeling and address the feeling and express the feeling and lots of homework assignments to really help them with free writing and coping. And so it, it's a very complex treatment. And I'm, I'm very, I'm so happy to hear that you guys are, are able to do that. You, you've had successful years of, of doing it and it's built in now to our culture mm. and as is the cult, relational cultural theory. Yeah. So, you know, it, I, I just, I wish those resources had been available back then, but mm -hmm. I'm happy that they're available now, you know, that mm -hmm. you've created a wonderful forum for young women and men. Mm -hmm. with yeah. and, and you, what happens is you create a culture, mm -hmm. an alternative culture. I mean, that at Brandeis, that's what I did I, with the yeah. group there. It was like, we all talk the same language. We all yeah. have stuff we do to ourselves so um my goal is to create an alternative culture in the big culture <laughs> mm -hmm. using rct as as the model for health yeah well that's amy that's yours and everybody's model right that's every, right um okay. i want to kate let me just interrupt you here i want to go back to some susan had had another question i think up in the thing that we didn't address which is also, if you're willing, um, I think this is to Melanie, maybe, what were you not getting, like not getting, not understanding when you had that meeting right. with me or, you know, the overview? What do you think was, you know? Mm. Yeah. yeah, well, I, I mean, I know, you know, in thinking about um, my um, <laughs> desire to do, my desire, I was trying to do the things and I couldn't sit there and just be in the experience with, with the client, right? In those videos that I was so, um, my head was so focused on the task and getting the task done that I was really uh, a metaphor that you often, at least in the many trainings I've uh, attended, start with is, you know, not seeing the forest from the trees. Right. And that I was getting stuck in the, the, the branches and the leaves. <laughs> And um, really, again, um, missing missing the big picture, missing the impact of you know when we talk about you know power and power differentials, and even not recognizing the power that I would would hold in a group or in an individual therapy session, and um, just missing and not realizing how much what I was doing or not doing was unintentionally reinforcing some of these power differentials, this kind of like expert mind power over stuff that, that certainly wasn't what I valued or was my intention, but that was what was, was happening and what was coming across to, to the client. And I, I couldn't see it. Um, um, I thought I was being helpful or I was trying, I was trying so desperately to be helpful 
that I was, um, I was missing, missing the experience. I was, you know, uh, zooming past the empathy and going straight to the, the fixing. Mm -hmm. right. um, I, I would just want to add to that, that I think that, you know, what I think we've come to recognize that this is the really hard work in right. teaching staff how to do this and, and learning it for ourselves and teaching staff how to do it. You know, it takes me back to the, the, the horse and the cart, you know, kind of thing. I didn't really have a clue about the whole horse being in the back, you know, but the how hard it is to have people lean into, you know, sort of being very present in themselves, being very connected with their own emotion, being pre very present with, you know, the, the patient client and how to be empathic. You know, we, we, I think we had the assumption that Okay, yeah, we're therapists, we're all empathic, we know how to do it. Well, you have to really, there's there's a skills to empathy. And that this is important that you know we be able to teach our staff the what of this. Yeah. Um, and it's probably the most challenging work that continues on now. You know, they understand the UP. I mean, we we taught them that part of it, but it's really the relational piece yeah. that I think is probably the most, you know, Mel, I don't know if that's your experience, but probably the most challenging kinds of things that you're you're trying to teach staff yeah well it remi reminds me that all of this is being done right in a culture that doesn't support relationship and that was you know one of the major things all all, all along right is how in the world do you emphasize relationship if the culture doesn't emphasize relationship and does is it a setup for people is it you know what what does that look like and how do you get people to buy in and you know and i think on the one hand it's always i think people that you know probably people collectively who are you know on the call even appreciate that it is one of those things that until you're actually in it and you can feel it you don't even know you know it's easy you, you know you can describe it um you know but how do you how do you get into that groove Right. And, and what I would say is it's, you know, it's appreciating that even relationship is both a cognitive and, a, and an affective thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and and additionally, that even the unifying protocol, because it's being implemented by people, is also a cognitive and a relational thing, right? You know, and so when we do this, you know, false dichotomy that the, you know, again, the actions over here with the unified protocol and the, you know, and the, you know, affect or whatever, or the, you know, the holding tank is the relationship, you miss, you know, you miss the whole point of the integration, right? That, you know, this happens, all of, you know, treatment happens between people. Um, and you can, and to maximize that, you know, you, you need very, very specific skills. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to say, let me just read Karen Samuels. I think she had to go, but she said, coming home to attend Renfrew Foundation conferences in the 1990s, before I knew anyone at Renfrew, I just knew my patients would be cared for at the Renfrew in a respectful, relational way. The collaboration as an RCT therapist with Renfrew staff has served countless of my patients over the years. I mean, I think that's the other part, right? How, how do you interact with people outside of the system? Um, I'll read Aish, your question. With regard to dealing with insurance and their requirement of CBT, EBT, is the RCT piece in the paperwork? This is a great question. Just not included. Like, does it have to be hidden, right? Or how do we prevent RCT from becoming the how when it comes to insurance, right? The neoliberal right. world out there is focused on the CBT being the what and mm -hmm. the how. Yeah. So yeah. great yeah. question, Aish. Yeah, I think that is a great question. You know, I, I think one of the things I would say is that we are making sure that when we're looking to measure things, that part of what we're trying to measure is the nature of the relationship, the nature of the connection that, you know, that that is, we see that as as important as, you know, in terms of what their behaviors are and what their thoughts are and whatnot, but what is the quality of the relationship that is happening here? And so um, that's one of the ways that we try to sort of stay, you know, have it stay sort of centralized in our understanding of it being integrated. Now, what impact that has on insurance is probably a whole nother discussion. I don't know necessarily that they're tuning in to that piece of it as well, but um, I, I certainly think that when we talk about our model, we're really talking about it all and not just the behavior, you know, the internal behavior changes and whatnot that are, that are going on. Yeah. 
and so far the insurance companies have been receptive, right? I mean, oh sure, yeah, they. Yeah. In, well, I was going to say, and partly for folks to know it. I mean, th this is the other thing that I think has again been so re uh, um, impressive is that you were doing, you know, uh, developing the model, training in the model, and the whole time also doing research in an ongoing way. So mm -hmm. people, you know, at different sites seeing, okay, in the Florida site, in the Pennsylvania site. So, you know, tracking when this program was implemented, imp implemented and what, what were the results, right? So, you know, and that I think has always been a, you know, incredibly difficult piece. One, because it's time consuming and costly, but without it, you just have the people talking about what they do, right? You know, in that world of insurance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I'm assuming since Renfrew keeps getting patients and, you know, I know I hear Sam, uh, who's the president talk about, you know, the, that he's, he's in the front end or people in that there are on the front end of trying to, you know, translate this for insurance companies for them to understand why, they, why this might be a step up mm -hmm. from some of the other programs, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a, you know, it's a large scale kind of education that has to happen as well, right? Mm -hmm. That you've taken on that Sam's taken on and other people in the you know, development department have taken on around uh, you know, the, the power of relationships, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Other folks have questions that they wanna either just raise their hand with or type out or comments? It is the ball, it, 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 it um, Am I muted or can you hear me? You can hear, we can hear you. Oh, okay, sorry. It is, it has evolved. The treatment of eating disorders has, has evolved to, to become, you know, with the, as you say, the depth and breadth that it needs because mm -hmm. it wasn't working to just, you know, get rid of symptoms and mm -hmm. work with it cognitively. And so it, it's a, it's a very complicated treatment <laughs> mm -hmm. and it, it, it keeps going keeps going you know it, it's really about the internal stuff that needs to be dealt with but you can't get there until mm -hmm. you get through the resistance of the eating disorder mm -hmm. so it's it's i'm i'm very happy and to know that you're really um moving forward still and doing the research and that's what's going to give it more credibility mm -hmm. right Thank you. unfortunately that's what that's the only thing that does but yeah Thank you. Um, uh, I'd just like to make a, a personal comment. I'm so proud of my colleagues, of course, Melanie and Gail. And we have been very fortunate. We have really been enriched by having Amy as part of our Clinical Excellence Board yes, and her yes. support and her wisdom and her friendship. It's been wonderful. Also, I'd like to say that one of the greatest highlights ever at a Renfrew conference was in the year 2000, we had Jean Baker Miller and Irene Stiver and Judy Jordan do a keynote. And that was, Fabulous. that was like one of the most wonderful events. And it really introduced our entire audience to the Stone Center and to the relational cultural theory. And so we have been very, very enriched and very, very fortunate to have been connected so closely with Amy and all of her colleagues and all of you. Mm -hmm. so thank you for all of that. Yeah, it's been a rich affiliation for many, many, many years. Um, and I mean, I guess that's the other arm of it is to know that the Renfrew Center, for folks that don't know, if you have eating disorder patients and or are a clinician that works with that, the Renfrew Center has for I mean, 30 years now had a, um, an annual meeting a conference. The Renfrew Foundation holds a conference that um, people come from all over the country and the world. I mean, anywhere from like, I mean, it's been like 500 to 2000, hasn't it, Judy? Um, you know, really people learning this and, you know, to imagine that you know, and increasingly this is a model that may be a, a, a standard of care in the eating disorder field that has come out of this and that's taught, you know, in various ways through the conference, um, through webinars. I mean, you guys also have a rich, um, you know, rich uh, ethic of sharing and putting out webinars for professionals and for, for clients. And, um, you know, so it's, again, it's the, 
you know, the thoroughness with which this organization has taken on, um, you know, the, uh, developing this treatment is really stunning. And I'm wondering for both of you too, um, that uniform for people who want to actually know more about the, uh, you know, can you get that, it, it, that manual, manual's for sale now? Um, for pre-sale. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. If you know what pre-sale is all about, but I yes, it's, it. um, it. <laughs> we're pre-sale on uh, Amazon and on Oxford Press, um, and I imagine there are other locations as well. It actually comes out in July, mid-July. Okay, great. Um, and we will be doing trainings on it as well as we go forward, and I know at the conference, um, Melanie and Heather Thompson-Brenner will yep. be presenting on it, um, as well as Amy Yu and, and Maureen. I, I saw that Maureen great. was on as well presenting at the conference this year. Yeah, so if anybody, yeah, we're gonna be trying mm -hmm. to do a, d a little deeper dive in, uh, into cultural aspects of both relationship and eating disorders. So um, for the next one. Um, Amy, and Maureen are, Amy and Maureen are keynote speakers. She's being very <laughs> modest. No, <right. laughs> yes. Uh, you've, we're getting a lot of thank yous here. Gals, any, anything you'd like to say in closing or? Oh, just how wonderful this has been. I mean, it feels like in a little, and in some ways like coming home to uh, sort of be uh, talking with you all and, um, you know, just how important this has been in terms of our, our kind of growth. So thank you for having us. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, you're getting lots of excellent presentations. And I just, you know, want to say again, what a pleasure it is to work with both of you and, and how exciting and inspiring the work has been. So thank you for joining us and sharing and um, you know, be, you know, Renfrew's out there is a huge resource and, uh, so is the International Center for Growth and Connection. And, you know, we're very lucky to have the overlap and the affiliation, um, you know, and that will continue. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.